Okay, I would like to welcome you to Forum One. My name is Jürgen Altmann. I'm a physicist and a peace researcher at the University of Dortmund. Amongst others, I have researched on unmanned armed systems and wrote articles on that. If somebody is interested in getting a copy or is interested in the website address, please contact me afterwards. Our topic is international law, arms race, and disarmament regime. First of all, I would like to introduce the panelists. To your right, I would like to welcome Philip Stroh. He is a lawyer at the moment. He is doing his training as a lawyer, and he is about to finish his doctoral thesis on armed drones and legal aspects. He is a project assistant at the Institute of Public Law, International Law, and European Law at the University of Gießen. Second panelists, panelist is Wolfgang Richter, colonel, retired. In 1989, he was already included in the negotiations on the Treaty on Conventional Forces in Europe that was eventually then signed in 1990. Later on, he worked for the Center of Verification Tasks of the Federal Army in Gallenkirchen. He did inspections there, and he accompanied other inspections in Germany. He was included in the international disarmament negotiations as a member of the German delegation. He was the head of the respective military branch in Geneva, in New York, and from 05 to 09. He worked for the International or Institute for International Security Affairs in Europe. We prepared some questions here. One question is, why do we deal with international law and arms race and disarmament regime issues with regards to new military technologies, not only drones, but also other aspects? Cyber attacks is dealt with in another forum today. And the second question would be, what should happen in those three areas? that is international law, arms race, and disarmament regime in order to prevent dangers and stem dangers that might threaten as a consequence of those new systems. The first half of our discussion should focus on the question, why do we deal with these three aspects? And then after 45 minutes, we should focus on different solutions and suggestions. So we will start with our two panelists. They will make brief statements and hopefully answer the first question. And then we will discuss with you, let's see what you are interested in then. Would you like to start? Thank you very much, Mr. Altman. So why do we deal with unmanned warfare with regards to international law and arms, race and armament? I mean, we have heard already that when it comes to combat drones, it is actually only further development of technologies that we have used on battlefields in the last centuries, bows, medium or, or missiles. So the drones are sort of a revolution in military affairs to a certain extent, but it is not alien to the battlefield. It is rather imminent because battlefields and means of warfare have always further developed. Every generation had its game changer. So what is new about it? That was actually the question. And compared with the course of history, compared with the different game changers that have established themselves on the battlefields, the Geneva right, Geneva Convention and additional protocols are rather young. Despite the youthfulness of the right, it turned out to be flexible and effective in the last years, I believe, especially when it comes to the containment of sufferings after wars that are triggered by certain weapons and weapons systems. So here, humanitarian international law put out certain bans on weapons. So dazzle, dazzlers or expanding bullets that we fortunately do no longer see on battlefields. So humanitarian international law is well tried and tested, I believe. Humanitarian international law, when it comes to the new developments that we are confronted with, can stand the test as well. The new forms of unmanned warfare, cyber warfare, automated warfare. I mean, here we have quite a few opportunities 
with regards to international law. The general stipulations and principles of human international law always have to be reinterpreted by practitioners and lawyers. I mean, things do not stagnate. We have to make sure that we interpret the new means of warfare in a way that we write the respective rules so that we can subsume them under those new rules, especially the general stipulations, the general principles of international humanitarian law. I mean, then the principle of proportionality, of necessity to use certain weapons. I'm sure that we will discuss that in a minute. It's not only the general principles, it's also specific principles that we have in the sense of bans or arms control regimes. They also have to be updated and changed. In the course of future developments, there can be an appropriate means to make sure that humanitarian international law is applied in an increasing way and is strengthened to a certain extent. And I hope that we can make a contribution to that debate here today. Thank you very much. So why do we deal with these issues? issues of international law and arms race. I think that new weapons technologies, as Mr. Stroh has just said, always challenge humanitarian international law. Mr. Kress said it is a euphemism. We should actually say war international law. But it also challenges another aspect, and that is the question, will new weapons technologies jeopardize military political stability? I'm sure that we are going to discuss both elements. Mr. Altman also sketched that briefly in his contribution. Allow me to start with humanitarian international law. Now, yesterday and today we talked about asymmetrical wars in particular that challenge international law in a specific way. And why? Because unfentional guerrilla groups avoid open fights and there are just intermittent surprise attacks out of ambush in territories that are difficult to access or out of the civil population. And this is the crux. This increases the survival chances of the guerrilla fighters, but it increases the risks of the civil population. I mean, we had have had this for many years. We do no longer talk about major wars anymore. I'm not sure that we won't have major wars in the future, though. Humanitarian international law, and Mr. Kress was quite clear here, I, I totally subscribe to what he said, requires the compliance of humanitarian minimum standards when it comes to dealing with combatants, as long as the combatants are legitimate combatants. And this also applies to those combatants who are no combatants. We would, would might call them illegal fighters. However, they are subject to certain criteria in order to be considered as legitimate targets in an international conflict. Military operations have to distinguish between combatants and the peaceful civil society. By no means can or should civilians become a target. And despite military necessities, military operations have to comply with the principle of proportionality. This is a very flexible term, and I think we have to discuss it. New technologies, when it comes to the problem of a distinction between combatants and civil society, seem to give better answers than those old-fashioned, terrible search-and-destroy methods of the past. Strike drones, for instance, are able for a longer period of time to, to keep certain areas under surveillance. And once they have been detected certain targets, there is an immediate response. So what can you achieve with that? You can fight against irregular combatants, for instance, those who go out of ambush for a short period of time. Then we have better reconnaissance and effectiveness. This is not only of military use because shortening the time between reconnaissance and strike also reduces the danger that until a guided missile, take cruise missiles or fighter bombers, change the targets. So during the time they fly and the demand time, the military target has already moved away and other persons have arrived there, just to give you an example. Now, I think the whole discussion suffers from the example that we are currently seeing when it comes to the use of drones 
that has been discussed for years and is covered in the media. This is the global war on terror led by the United States. The United States operates in a gray zone between humanitarian and international law on the one hand and the Human Rights Pact on the other. Mr. Kress sketched that very nicely, and I have nothing to add. It is clear, however, that in non-international armed conflicts, you can only attack those combatants any time that comply with the criteria of legitimate targets. And outside of this legal framework, targeted killings of suspected people, from my perspective, and we can discuss that, are against international law. I think there is consensus amongst German international law experts and also European ones and this is denied for the well-known reasons by the United States. Our debate sort of suffers from the fact that we have this unfortunate example of the UN drone, U.S. drone war, and we take that as a blueprint. And we think that if the German army purchased drones, that this would uh, be the role model. It wouldn't be the role model of the United States for Germany. If there is a non-compliance of one country. That doesn't mean that other countries don't comply with that either. So if there is a considerate operation of those arms, there is a different situation. We have those ban conventions, and you have to assume that they fulfill one of these two criteria. So this is one aspect I wanted to sketch. The other will be a little shorter. And here I'm referring to the military or military political stability. Now, do new weapons lower thresholds? Strike drones are no wonder weapons. Against intact arm defense, they are as vulnerable as other we means and weapons, sometimes even more vulnerable than fighter bombers. So in conventional scenarios, they can only be to used together with other weapons. And this pre -require, or requires the suspension of air defense, but they could also be optimized for that purpose. The SEAT zone that you talked about earlier is, of course, the suppression of enemy air defense. This is, of course, something that you could do, like stealth capabilities. So radar detection through forms or radiation. So you should try to circumvent radar detection. In such a configuration, strike drones could also become a mandate when it comes to the implementation of a non-fly zone. Certain weapon systems do not lower the war threshold because the capabilities to wage war do not depend on one system, but they depend on the whole military capabilities, reconnaissance, etc., all systems. So war decisions remain political decisions that are first and foremost made by different governments, led by different interests, values, but also led by different political cultures and constitutions and the consideration of political and military risks. And I think that here we can claim that the German culture, the German political culture that is, to make a decision in favor of certain military forces is totally different from the American culture. Here there are major differences also when we discuss that with each other. However, I believe that the introduction of strike drones might jeopardize military stability if they suspend certain transparency and arms control regulations. If they were, for instance, introduced without being notified, what are they? They are fighter airplanes that are unmanned. The pilot is on the ground. But in terms of their configuration and definition, also according to the respective contracts, they are fighter airplanes that are equipped with certain arms. These are actually the same weapons as the weapons of aircraft or bombers. If that was the case, and here we talk about the KSE Treaty, we are talking about the Article 4 of the Dayton Peace Agreement, we are talking about the Moscow Contract of 97, and we talk about transparency instruments like the Viennese document that demands a weapons register, etc. If that materialized, then we would have less transparency in this world. And we would also have arms control conventions that would be undermined or disregarded. And for that reason, well, this actually brings me to the second question. And I'm not going to focus on that. This is the second or third question. So let me end here. Uh, uh, thank yeah, thank you very much. 
as regards the categorization of war international law of remote controlled arms, there's no dissent here. We have heard similar things this morning. It might be worth discussing the question of autonomous combat systems. Mr. Kress said that he is still forming his opinion, which is quite fine. Some ideas are already on the table. On the one hand, there is the moratorium suggestion of the United Nations, special rapporteur for extrajudicial executions. And on the other hand, there is a slowly growing small international campaign that tries like a ban on land, mines, and stray ammunition. They also try to implement a ban on autonomous weapon systems. Maybe both of you can comment on that before we come to arms race and disarmament. Yes, when it comes to autonomous systems, Mr. Kress said that he was still thinking about things, but I'd like to do that as well. But I believe that humanitarian international law is very much linked to assessments and discretion. We mentioned the principle of proportionality, and we saw we thought that this is, we talked about the fact that this is international law that needs to be interpreted. So here, well-experienced militaries would have to take the decisions that are not easily to be taken. And I wouldn't want to be in the situation to take these decisions, especially when it comes to pondering um, potential collateral civilian damage. And we're not at a point where we can believe in any way that a machine can make an assessment with a judgment that seems human to us. And we heard about the example about the child, and Noel Sharkey mentioned it in one article, that the child wants to share his ice cream with a robot and runs towards the robot like this. Correct me if I'm wrong. To my knowledge, we're not in a situation by far where these judgments and decisions based on judgments and reactions to irrational human behavior can be taken or carried out by machines. So in my process of thinking, I'm maybe one step further, and I would say that in humanitarian international law, there is no space for the application of autonomous systems because the principles of proportionality and discretion and discrimination don't apply. In humanitarian international law, there is the principle that the conflicting parties at any time have to discriminate between um, civilians and fighters or combatants. And you can also imagine it like this, that in an urban environment, even for a very sophisticated system, this is hardly possible to make this distinction and to discriminate. Um, and uniforms are often a good um, a marker to mark somebody as a soldier. But when we don't have that and when we enter the field of combatants or maybe illegal uh, fighters, they are not um, endowed and equipped with insignia of any kind. So how should a machine make the distinction and draw the line here. And we're not even in an area where uh, combatants could try to actually cheat on the machine about one's own status. So the decision-making principle and the proportionality principle cannot be respected at any rate by artificial intelligences or whatever you might may call this. So I can always talk, talks about the ethical governor that he'd like to integrate. But to my mind, this is all not sufficient to comply with humanitarian international law standards. So I don't see any legal leeway to use this type of weapon system. Do you have any objections to this argument? Otherwise, I'd ask a subsequent follow-up question. Well, I'd qualify this a little bit. When it comes to the definition, what is a fully automated operation, we should differentiate. Let's take the example of strike drones, because this is what we talked about most. So to call them fully autonomous, and this is predicted for the next 20 years to come, we can say that it's the case when it can monitor a target area autonomously and identify targets autonomously and possibly can also attack targets autonomously. But we have to add that this target category uh, is incorporated, um, but there is still a 
and it is programmed so there is still a commander in chief or military staff that defines the target category. This is just to clarify things because we would have to talk about the responsibility or, and attributability um, of commanders for later criminal prosecution. So the decision on the use of these weapons is reserved to the team in command and and could it could also intervene on demand and we define it within the loop and on the loop yesterday and there's also the extreme version of being out of the loop i.e. that the autonomous system does something uh, which it was programmed for. And this, of course, leads to international law problems, but there are nuances to it. I agree with Mr. Stroh. Programming, technically speaking, should not be able to assess and judge the international law situation of a target. It all depends on the particular situation and proportionality of the operation will have to be judged in terms of the operative and situative context. And we might doubt that programming can predict and anticipate all options that might occur. And so human discretion is missing here. But a fully autonomous operation might be possible in a situation where the operational lead makes sure that in this particular area in which fully autonomous weapons are used, we can rule out that civilian population could be hit. Let me mention one example. During the Cold War, the German army in its planification used um, remote uh, weapons, artillery, missile launches that could cover a wide field. Why was that possible? Such a weapon cannot discriminate, cannot make decisions and distinctions, but it was possible because the operational lead ensured that it dealt with an evacuated fighting zone. And you're right that in an urban environment, this could not even be thinkable. And international law doesn't only talk about weapons, but also about methods of warfare. And we would call that either military operation or uh, operational procedure. There are different nuances to it. But when you or if you make sure that a combat robot operates in a very confined space, in a geographically confined territory or locally confined space and can be activated and deactivated and that people remain in full control or, or that control can be carried out, then I think it's not against... Um, international law. In the past, you had the mine that just reacted and exploded because it was touched upon or it, it was also triggered by noise, underwater noise for underwater mines. And these situation would make sense for robots even more sensibly than for mines that can't take decisions. But this is not what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the fact that mines were put at the times of the Cold War, where people believed not to have enough forces, enough troops, and they wanted to prevent uh, tanks from hitting them. And if you have that area of 500 times 2 kilometers, or 500 meters times 2 kilometers, if you ensure that no tank would enter, I think this is legitimate. But if a robot carries out a seared uh, operation and in order to enforce a mandate for an air strike ban, I think um, in terms of international law, it is plausible or thinkable. But I think the red line has to be drawn somewhere else. As long as we are under time pressure defending against ourselves against missiles, international law is quite all right, and here machines can help uh, whenever humans don't have the time to defend themselves. And in the case I mentioned, I can imagine it too. But wherever you have an asymmetrical war and wherever you believe that targeted killing of individuals or signature strikes, so these are attacks on groups of persons that uh, um, are somewhat striking because of their behavior and their uniforms and weapons, and to trigger that automatically. I think there we are crossing a red line which must not be crossed. And here um, there are too many 
possibilities of going wrong. So this fighting machine would not be able to um, abide by the criterion of proportionality in different situations and contexts. And this is uh, why I would be against lethal attacks on individuals and groups of persons and rule them out. But I would introduce a caveat where you've got military targets, and this can be can be programmed so that it, you um, fight against a tank or a plane, then it might be legitimate to bear that in mind and to think about it when these things can be controlled. Thank you for this differentiated point of view. I feel tempted to make arguments, but I'm only the chair here. So I suggest that we talk about the second topic. Now, what about um, the arms race? Do we have to be afraid of an arms race here using these systems, or is this already going on? As a humanitarian international lawyer, we, well, I deal, well, not with the disarmament regime, so with what but with what the conflicting parties plan. But if you ask me for my personal assessment, I think that the danger of an arms race being sped up exists, and we can see it in the combat tr drones that are remotely controlled. And I think there are, meanwhile, more than 80 states that have these drones. A couple of years ago, the situation looked quite different, so we can observe an evolution or a development there leading to um, a more frequent use of these drones in the arsenal of warfare, of the states in warfare. Well, is this a problem? Is autonomy, be, is autonomy a problem? I think, yes, it is, because yesterday we said that when it comes to strike drones, the step from remote control towards autonomy can be made very swiftly. So it can be done via download of software. And if you can cross this line that easily, that rapidly, and then I think we do have a realistic threat that an arms race might be launched by that, all the more so that no industrial nation and maybe smaller nations would not want to dispense with this technology once it's introduced on the battlefield. And we've witnessed this in the last decade that uh, once something is on the battlefield, then then the wish to use it is expressed and is also implemented by all the conflicting parties to take part in this warfare. Okay, just to be sure, these 80 states or 87 that were mentioned yesterday, they refer to those that own drones, even intelligence and reconnaissance drones, but there's only a handful of states that have armed drones are about to import them, and exports are prepared by some other states like China. So you would have to bear in mind that dimension so that there still is a chance to contain this um, in the run-up for the countries that don't have them. But this would require some concessions by the two countries that produce for themselves, the United States and Israel. And this would require a political conviction and persuasion process. Would you like to comment on the arms race in the face of new military technology? Yes, I think that qualitative and quantitative arm armament has accompanied us for centuries. This is the negative news. Technology advances in all fields, and mostly it's dual-use technology. So in most parts, it's also used by the civilian sector, not only by the military ones, and there's always mutual interaction. So you can use a plane for the globalization of traffic, but also for combat purposes. And this development started 100 years ago, and it will go on, and I don't hope and I cannot hope that such a development and speeding up of technologies might be contained to the civilian sector, but it will also and always be used in a military sense. This is a realistic assessment, which doesn't mean that I don't see any dangers here that are connected to this. In Europe, we had a quantitative arms race for 40 years, and finally we've managed in 1989 and 90 to conclude 
um, a disarmament or an arms control treaty that led to fundamental disarmament in Europe. I can tell you 110,000 larger weapon systems that were dispensed with in Europe in the time after 1990. It was the biggest disarmament wave outside of war periods. Uh, of course, there were also some other collapses of regimes where something like that happens. But in peacetime, this was the largest wave of disarmament happening in Europe at all times. And this was for quantitative armament. Two restrictions. Quality could not always be covered by these treaties. Qualitative armament goes on. And second restriction, it referred to the relationship between East and West. So this treaty was confined and contained to Europe. It does not refer to the Middle East or to the Indian subcontinent or Southeast and East, East Asia. Here, uh, the arms race goes on happily, uh, in inverted commas, qualitatively and quantitatively, and we can see a shift of the arms race spiral towards these areas. But still, I'd second what Mr. Altman said. It's a basic function and political achievement of European states and of the USA. It would be a good example to act as a role model to not just let this conventional arms control die because the treaty runs the risk of being... Um, abandoned. But if you want to have the role of a model example and it's something we both suggested, then fighter drones should be included in the system of the CFE Treaty, the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces, and um, define them as flying arms and, um, well, the, the pilots or the crew are not mentioned in the definition. And this is my answer, because undermining these treaties would mean opening gates. It would mean undermining the trust in cooperative arms control. And it would also undermine the role model character with which we try to sort out conflicts or influence conflicts the way we have them in the South Chinese Sea at the moment or in other parts of the world where there are states that say, well, uh, a CFE regime would be something good for us. I'm mentioning Pakistan that said that and expressed that in many UN resolutions. So in that sense, yes, military stability can be undermined by new weapons technologies and conventional arms control gives us the trust that quantitative degenerations are somewhat curtailed, and this would be the model that could be examined in your second or third question. Thank you. We have one first hand that is being raised. Can you maybe hand the microphone? Yes. It's coming towards us. It's better with the microphone. It's because of the translation amongst other things. One question addressed directly to Mr. Richter, a question out of concern and feeling of unease. Mr. Stroh said that our civilian and civil standards and international law standards are not sufficient in view of the progressive technological advances and of what's feasible in the military. What about the perspectives? What about the prospects? when thinking of different forms of international law, different structures like the United Nations or the NATO, um, there are militaries that obviously have to be highly competent because you're saying for yourself that decisions on war and peace are political decisions and anything that goes with political decisions doesn't have anything to do with me as a citizen and the citizen today can read and can get an insight and you could actually um, give citizens more and, and allow them to have greater competence. And I'd like to, I'd like you to open up this perspective to get courageous and brave enough to uh, challenge us in a cross-border way and give us a multitude of answers. We might briefly answer, otherwise it's a question for the second part of our discussion, what should happen in the future comment without microphone. No worries. We're going to take it up. Thank you for the question. You're actually quite right. I don't believe that the statement by Mr. Kress of this morning and by Mr. Stroh meant that um, international law standards were not enough, quite to the contrary. So in the additional protocol number two, we see one explicit case. So the additional protocol to the Geneva Convention of 1970-70 there was a clear explanation saying that 
international law constraints also apply in a non-international armed conflict, and this principle applied even before, but here the rules were more explicitly expressed. But the problem in both additional protocols were that the U.S. did not ratify them or didn't – well, the – well, the majority of states um, abide by it and it's become common law. But personally speaking, I believe that the basic standards of humanitarian international law for armed conflicts remain in, in place and applicable. And you can tell three major standards. First, the distinction between combatants that have a certain legal status and that are defined. So you cannot call anybody any hatred preacher or combatant in terms of humanitarian international law, which is not right. Second, the responsibility of commanders for military operations. And thirdly, proportionality of the operation. And I will would have to have to invert, to invert the order, but the proportionality of the operation might be a soft point, and we might think about whether we define this more precisely. But so far, the states or the armies were the ones waging war and judging proportionality. So according to this definition, proportionality means that you can accept a certain specific collateral damage, and collateral damage is a very bad term because this refers to civilian victims and casualties or damage done to civilian objects. And if the military advantage requires this. So when reading it, you might seem that it's up to the uh, parties to make this distinction, but it's not without limits. If you've got a mandate like the ISAF mandate for Afghanistan, the mandate says that the troops in operation there are supposed to stabilize the country, which means that the efforts made by the government to stabilize the country should be supported by the troops. The mandate does not say, let's go and hunt the Taliban. So that means that a tactical advantage that uh, might be important to a commander does not need to be a strategic advantage because the strategic orientation of such an operation is the stabilization of a country. So if you hunt down Taliban um, in an arbitrary way and um, generate more hatred because you might also uh, kill family members and other people all along, then this strategic purpose can be questioned. This is my thesis. So especially in UN mandated operations, the ponderation of proportionality is not arbitrary, but has to be um, subject to political constraints. But of course, you can, we could further refine this interpretation. Mr. Crest this morning mentioned the uh, right of detention, the idea of the IKHK, the International Committee of the Red Cross. So, to use this in non-international conflicts where there are many peaceful zones as well, that we might have to, to say, yes, detention capture is, goes before killing. Otherwise, uh, there's always the principle that we have to define legitimate targets and we have to be able to tell that anybody who belongs to an armed military organization under leadership and taking control of parts of the country and can enforce this law, that they are legitimate targets at any time, regardless of what they're doing, regardless of whether they're withdrawing, whether they're fighting in the trenches and, or in logistics. So these people belonging to that organization can be attacked at any time. But persons that don't belong to that group, and this is the problem of the the American drone policy, persons not fulfilling these criteria couldn't be attacked, can't be attacked. They are ruled out, and this is what um, human rights rules apply to. And then this uh, possibility of killing a person goes towards zero, except if you would have to defend yourself when arresting this person. This is maybe the only legitimate defense situation. Then we've got two more questions. Afterwards, I'd say let's move on to the second complex of questions, or three questions, please. I also have a brief question to Mr. Richter. You said that drones and similar weapons systems will not facilitate the decisions in and on war. I agree, because it is actually a political decision. It might be that I am taking a, an intelligence perspective here, but isn't the idea of drones that targeted killings should stay beyond the war threshold? so that you can capture al-Qaeda fighters, so that you don't have to invade a whole country, 
but that you just use drones in order to kill people in a targeted way. And then I am asking myself, how realistic is it that you can create confidence-building measures in this sphere? You have just mentioned what rules we have already in international law, how this can be measured. You also said that disarmament regimes... Uh, in the area of conventional weapons might also create trust to a certain degree. But when it comes to drones, it is a very specific question, I know. But is it realistic that you can really set up trust or confidence-building measures between different states? Okay, let me make a brief remark. If you hear drones, you usually hear about predators, those things flying above Afghanistan. X-47B was shown by Peter Singer. This is an unmanned fighter bomber which can exert violence, that can throw bombs, that can operate machine cannons or launch missiles like F-16 and tornadoes do. So it's not only that drones, it's, it's not only that drones focus on targeted killings, but we have fully capable fighter bombers unmanned that are equally equipped and prepared. That was just a side remark from me, but Mr. Richter, you would probably want to say something. Well, your question, well, usually we are dealing with two aspects here. It is the aspect of military political stability. This is one side of the coin. And the humanitarian side is the other side. And we have different tools for that. Military stability, for instance, does not imply a ban on weapons. It means a reduction of weapons, usually regarding the number. When it comes to humanitarian concerns, we have to achieve a ban. It is a totally different thing. Allow me to focus on the war threshold that you mentioned. You are absolutely right. Drones are used below the official war threshold for quite some time. But the recent argumentation of the Americans, if you read the statements of the Department of Justice, is that this is a mixed form that they want to have. It is a mixed form of an expansion of the area, of non-international armed conflicts, that is, in combination with law enforcement. So enforcement of criminal law is meant here. And then they said, well, we would like to capture, but we cannot always do it. Therefore, we have to kill in certain cases. This argumentation is a vicious cycle to a certain extent, because if you go for the humanitarian international law, then you don't have to capture, then you can target. If you feel uneasy, then you say, oh, it is rather criminal law. And if you say that, then I cannot capture because the conditions are different which was obviously different with bin Laden. So that is a very questionable train of thought. And it has something to do, from my perspective, with the culture of intelligence operations. Somebody said it already here. What war on terror with drones used to be killer commands, agents. There was a time where Bill Clinton launched cruise missiles as a response to those things. But as a rule, it is intelligence operations that can be categorized as small covert wars. That is under the threshold of the official war. The Americans have a long tradition there. Have a look at the history of the Marines outside of America, outside of the continent, Dirty wars were led, and the civil society didn't even know about that in the U.S., didn't want to know about that. In times of the Internet, that is no longer possible, of course, as a consequence. There's the focus on this. But it is still the old intelligence operations that have nothing to do with warfare. It is targeted killing. It is usually called war, but it is not a war. Me, as an old commander, retired, really says, no, that's not true. It is not war. It is killing. Whether we can do something, well, I totally subscribe to what Mr. Kress said. No matter who does it, the army, intelligence, police forces, whoever, if there is no humanitarian international law framework, if there is no international armed conflict, then different units, these are not sovereign units, then it is only the state that can act outside of the Human Rights Pact. What confidence measures can we then implement, confidence-building measures? Well, it comes down to underlining humanitarian international law. We might come back to that in a minute. The question is, how, what can we do in order to limit that at the international law level? 
When it comes to disarmament issues and confidence building measures, we have instruments. We have the UN Weapons Register, for instance. There's one state that uh, reports on those imports, and this is the UK. They we ha they reported or introduced introduced or imported two reapers from the United States in 2007, and they have registered this in the UN Weapons Register. This would be a role model. Then we have the CFE Treaty, the Dayton Agreement, the Moscow Treaty. It is a gray. It is a border zone between China, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, where you have a 100k zone where you have a CFE similar regime with arms limitations, reductions, inspections, etc. So the Chinese know exactly how it works. They have experiences. They inspect and they have others inspect them, even if it is a limited territory. And fighter bombers are exactly defined like in the different treaties or in the Viennese document, the OSCE framework. So all those tools and instruments are appropriate and we are advocates of that, that we introduce the strike drones, make them transparent there. And as regards the SFE treaty, we can also re have reductions in terms of quantities. Okay, this is already our second part here, actually. It's not bad because we are otherwise running late. What about these two questions over there? Would you like to pose them? Yes, okay. Earlier on, you said that we don't know what future developments will be. I mean, we know that drones were equipped with nerve gas in Pakistan in order to make something against aggressions. Do we know that the normal drones, or how do we make sure that drones will not become A, B, C weapons one day? I don't think that this is not the case. Let me be very clear here. Secondly, Mr. Kress mentioned that earlier, but nobody focused on it, actually. To what extent is security given? He mentioned civil war. To what extent is it secure and clear that the United States and Germany within Europe do not use drones or do not trigger civil war-like situations with their drones? What do we do if Russia did that or China with Mongolia? Do you dare give an answer? Well, as regards the question of whether drones can't be used as carriers of ABC weapons can be actually abused, yes, of course. They are very flexible in terms of their use. Mr. Altman and myself, in the context of a peace orchestra made a respective statement there. We said that there is the risk that drones are used as carriers of nuclear warheads. So this risk exists. However, this risk does not does also exist with other weapons carrier systems. The case that you have just sketched, the nerve gas in Pakistan, uh, is something that I have never heard of, I have to say. It would probably also be a violation of the anti-chemical weapons treaty. So we have treaties that deal with that already. I do see the problem, but I think that we have some conventions in that field, like the biological and chemical weapons treaties. When it comes to nuclear warheads, the situation is slightly different, but President Obama said something on that a couple of days ago, and there might be new hope. Drones in civil war situations. Well, we have that too. Many states use drones in those in the way of targeted killing just to attack smaller groups. And of course, there's this risk. Whether the risk exists on the European continent depends on the overall political situation. Unfortunately, it is more or less stable at the moment, at least when it comes to the whole picture to what extent it is used by police missions or for riot control, 
how do we deal with demonstrations that are sort of unwanted, whether they could be attacked with drones is a matter of police law that we would then exceed the threshold to civil war. Yes, let's hope that this is not going to be the case. But of course, strike drones could be a means that could be used in such situations. So the possibility, the option is there, yes. Yes, I mainly agree. The case that you have sketched, that from Pakistan, a strike drone was launched with some gases. I mean, I have never heard of this either. If that was the case, according to the chemical weapons or biological and toxical weapons treaty, this would have been prohibited. It is true what he said. The drone is a carrier means, also like other aircraft. It is an aircraft. We must not forget that. It is just remotely controlled. It is unmanned. However, there is one regulation that I would also mention in that case. If you have, if you optimize a carrier, if you optimized a carrier so that you, so that this means can carry chemical weapons, then it would be explicitly prohibited by the respective treaty. This is a very vague response because I have never heard of the case that you mentioned. And that treaties are violated is nothing new in history, but the international law standard is there, and there's no doubt about it. We can only hope that at the end of the civil war in Syria, Syria will also sign the ABC treaty. As regards the civil war, I don't think that I, answer, uh, that I understood your question correctly. Are you alluding to a civil war in the US or Germany or generally? Sorry, that was off the mic. The interpreters could not hear that. Well, this is a general question that we also have in the area of responsibility to protect. To what extent can a government, can a state use weapons against their own population? I mean, Syria is the example now, and we think that this is problematic. There are different assessments. I mean, here again, the proportionality of means has to be complied with. Illegitimate government can, of course, defend itself. This is the case in Afghanistan. And then it does not so much come down to using violence. It's sort of normal then. This is why it is a non-international armed conflict. But it then comes down to the criteria that are applied to use violence. We mentioned the criterias, criteria earlier. Distinction between combatants and non-combatants, proportionality of means, and the responsibility of commanders. So if these criteria were given, then it would, come, would not come down to the question of weapons. The weapon has to fulfill those criteria, be it a drone or a fighter bomber. I mean, that is not the precise, decisive criterion here. So in the cases where there is a legitimate use of weapons inside a country in the context of international non-armed conflicts, all weapons can be used that supply, or, no, sorry, fulfill those criteria. Okay, but we are discussing international problems here, and national problems are rather a marginal problem, I would say. Sorry, the lady is not using a microphone. Oh, yeah, that, that can be, but this is a problem that the U.S. population has to solve with its own democratic means, and they can do that. We have 30 minutes left, so I would suggest that we have a private discussion on that topic later or during the break, because we would now like to come to the next question. What has to happen in order to contain the risks, both for war, international law, both for arms races and disarmament regimes to be created? So how do we deal with that? Who would like to start? Well, this is a question that we often hear, especially when it comes to strike drones that are currently being used or how they are currently being used, and also with regards to the question of what is to follow and what can you do. Now, when talking about combat drone, 
drones, the state-of-the-art drones, Predator, Reaper, or X-47B, which is just a further development of what we have already. This is a remote-controlled weapon, although the X-47B can also automatically fly once it is used. As regards the state-of-the-art drones, I think that a ban that has already been demanded or in outlawing, it's not really reasonable because once something has been established, it is very, very difficult to eliminate those launcher systems from the battlefield. I mean, when it comes to strike drones, they are unfortunately an established means, and they are already being used by quite a few nations, and many states want to acquire them. Therefore, an international outlawing convention or treaty or a ban is not really realistic and would maybe not make sense because despite all skepticism, you have to bear in mind that there is also the possibility to lead a more precise war in order to reduce individual suffering. So that is also a theoretical option that you have with strike drones. What could be possible both for strike drones and autonomous weapon systems is what Mr. Richter mentioned earlier. I have to subscribe to that, so it is sort of different from what I said earlier. Autonomous weapon systems in an area where it is absolutely ruled out that you have civilian damage trigger less headache. And therefore, I could imagine that at least when it comes to autonomous systems, maybe also when it comes to remote control systems, the use of those systems is contained and reduced to an extent where it is ruled out that non-military targets can be targeted. We know that from the humanitarian international law, there are regulations on napalm bombs, the use of fire bombs. Those weapons can only be used if it is absolutely excluded that there are civilists, that there are civilians, sorry, in the area of where the weapon will be used. So there is an example in law that we can use. And that could also apply to strike drones. When it comes to strike drones, I think this is a tangible way that could be discussed. Of course, there will be resistance. But when it comes to autonomous systems, this is the lowest threshold of regulation that we should strive for. That is reducing the use to a very narrowly defined area. Maybe we should also use the campaign to stop killer robots and thus strive for a ban. Well, as I said, we have to embark upon two different directions. One refers to the concerns regarding humanitarian international law when new technologies are introduced. And then we have another concern, that is the military political stability that is being jeopardized. I said that we have different tools for both ways that we have to walk on. Let me start with remote controlled drones that we see in use at the moment and that will probably be used in the future. Mr. Stroh mentioned it, therefore I can be brief here. Remote controlled drones can be used in accordance with international law. It has nothing to do with the framework that the United States has chosen. I'm not talking about that, but it can go in harmony with international law. And the precision of this weapon can even create a situation where you better comply with humanitarian international law. So there is sort of an obligation, I think, an obligation of the states to use the best of all reconnaissance options in certain combat situations just to make sure that the situation is assessed well. And in order to do so, you need rapid responses once you have detected something. If you only use a guided weapon that takes 30 to 40 minutes to get there where you cannot get anything back, but where the situation at the target area has changed, then it would be much more problematic. When it comes to cruise missiles or fighter bombers, this criticism wasn't uttered, strangely enough, but it was uttered in the context of drones. So if the legal framework was right, drones could be even more precise. 
When it comes to humanitarian international law, I don't think that we have to update or change anything. We have all norms that we need. Of course, they have to be complied with. The fully autonomous use needs to be assessed slightly differently. Here again, you have to say the following. If you have time constraints so that you cannot think about reasonable defense, this is when you are attacked with missiles, then you need autonomous functions. It is not only better, but it's also the obligation of countries to protect their own civil population. The Iron Dome system, for instance, which selects between incoming missiles flying onto a field and missiles that would fall on urban territories, and they will then be shot down, then those are automated functions, autonomous functions that are, I think, unproblematic. So same with regards to defense of German ships or the automatic defense of missiles that are on fighter bombers. I mean, you could say that this is rather defensive. It can be expanded by another layer and... We could say exactly what you mentioned. If you can say that w through the method of operation, if you can really say that those strike robots are no only used in areas where you can say this is a war zone, there are no civilian targets, this war zone is limited in terms of space and time, then it might be feasible that you do this in harmony with humanitarian international law. However... And this is the point I want to make. If it comes down to making selections based on parameters, based on algorithms, based on software in short, that then target specific individuals or implement so-called signature strikes, attack people because of a suspicious behavior, here I would have problems because, well, the criterion individual is not a military criterion. This is targeted killing. For a soldier, it doesn't make a difference what face is behind a tank or a cannon. It is about reducing a military threat. I don't have to kill an individual. It's actually not the ultimate target of military operations. The target is to win a fight. That many people lose their lives is reality, but it's actually not the target. However, if I kill a person or an individual, then I end up in those intelligence operations that we discussed earlier. I don't need that function in terms of military. Signature strikes are equally dangerous because, first of all, you cannot guarantee, technically speaking, that you can distinguish between your own forces, friendly forces, militias, police forces, and weapons cultures. We have many states on this planet where it is part of male culture to carry arms or to fire arms uh, if there is a celebration or whatever. To distinguish here will not be possible anymore because it is based on a specific situation. So you have to assess the individual situations, and this has to be done by human beings because the risk of failure, of collateral damage that is not wanted is just too high. And it's not necessary in asymmetrical wars because here we are not under time pressure. But hunting individuals, targeting individuals after weeks and months will be successful if there is the respective window of opportunity. So sometimes it takes weeks or months. Where is time pressure? I don't see it in that scenario. So this is the red line. And I think that we again have to distinguish between what can you do. We talked about the tools, UN weapons convention, for instance, laser weapons, incendiary weapons. I mean, the problem at the end of the day is the following. A strike drone is a flying platform which cannot be banned. It is an aircraft. Secondly, the weapons that this drone carries are the same weapons, very precise, that fighter bombers carry. So those weapons are not banned either. So what do you want to prohibit? So you would have to prohibit a procedure this could be considered to be a method of warfare. So you would have to bend a procedure, a method which is dangerous as such, because it does not allow for this distinction norm. And what is even more important, because it does not allow for considering on the ground what is proportional and what is not proportional, maybe even more important than distinction, because in the fog of war, people also make mistakes when it comes to distinguishing things. 
So here I believe that it would be reasonable if the international community of states came up with an internationally binding declaration saying that even in the age of robotics, norms, fundamental standards, distinction, proportionality, and responsibility remain effective and that there are, it is not possible to lead operations, again, individuals. So, militarischen Stabilität. So would you like to comment on military stability? Military stability is a different area. It does not refer to bans on weapons, but on the prevention of arms races and spirals. It allows for weapons, but limits its number, the numbers by defining them. So there's a qualitative limitation, which is way leaker, weaker than the quantitative limitation. Um, the KSC Treaty, uh, the CFE Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces is one example for that. But there are also agreements that uh, foster transparency, the UN Weapons Registry and the OECD document and all these documents need to be strengthened and my plea would be to integrate incorporate uh, drones in all these treaties and agreements to uh, but, and to limit them as well and then we have a problem and I'm addressing this question to you these tools work primarily in Europe and in the Western world, but they don't work outside of the area of application of these tools, and they don't contribute to containing the arms race we see in Southeast Asia, East Asia, on the Indian subcontinent, etc. And here it'd be all about implementing arms control with the experience of Europe and make some advertising and interfering into their sphere and offering our models maybe to them so that they can settle their disputes so as not to have an escalation towards war. Question directed to all of you. Why is it that the Greens have so little interest in conventional arms control? Is that too complicated? Because there's no NGO here. It is an easy message to say, yes, I am for a ban on weapons. It's clear, concise, and it's easy. But conventional arms control is highly complicated. Unfortunately, even in Europe, it's under threat. The CFE, Treaty on Conventional Arms Forces, is suspended, and the follow-up agreement is blocked by NATO, and the Russians blocked too. So we have a problem here. So I'd wish for civil society being involved in a stronger way. Um, pushing for this good old instrument, conventional arms control, to maintain it, to improve it, and maybe to expand it regionally. Thank you. Thank you. Before introducing another round of questions for the audience, two questions. Did I get that right? You don't wish for an additional protocol that bans on certain uses, but just a declaration that we will abide by international war law. Second question, if you allow for automatic killing in some areas, you might glide and slide into an extension of application when and once military has introduced it uh, in some areas, they would wish to use them in other situations as well, wouldn't they? Well, getting back to your last question, I think maybe you underestimate the militaries. We did not talk about on, on which levels robotics is used. It's the military lead that wants to take strategic and military decisions every day. And I'm not aware of any technical developments, and not even Peter Singer would have said so, that would have leaped across these um, levels of lead, um, lowering the threshold for war. Peter Singer, in his last article in the IP, made it quite clear where he positions robotics. He talked about the warfighter's associate at the lowest warfare level as the associate of the combatant. And this is how I'd see things. But on this level, robotics um, is incorporated into operational lead. So wherever you can make sure that the basic standards of humanitarian international law are abided by, I believe that in a controlled way they could be thinkable to be careful. 
I'm hardly putting it, but wherever the danger becomes too big, uh, so as we can no longer abide by these basic norms, and this would always be the case in automatic functions where you target individuals or carry out signature strikes, I don't think this is responsible. And um, getting back to your first question, at this point, I would rule it out. But the question arises from the systematics of the international of international disarmament law. If you look at the UN Weapons Convention, then it refers to the so-called margin clause. Um, these are weapons that, as per they, their nature, cannot be contained to military targets. And second criterion, they cause unnecessary pain and suffering. And this is how the UN Weapons agreement is described in a very long name. We just call it weapons agreement, but uh, actually the name is three lines long. And there are additional protocols to it, and they all refer to weapons. I don't want to exclude that in some particular cases procedures are mentioned in the mine protocols, for example. But I'm not aware of any additional protocol referring to procedures only. But because what can this procedure do for us. This procedure protocol would maybe have to mention the ban of automated killing of individuals or groups, and then make it clear at the same time that there are other automated functions in the military that can still be used. But where does such a protocol fit? Actually, not in terms of systematics. It will, it will actually not that much fit into the UN Weapons Convention, but we would rather need a convention added, added to the Geneva Conventions saying that even at the times of robotics, these basic norms apply, and that wherever they can't be implemented and enforced, that then lethal attacks on persons, individuals, and groups of persons are banned giving the explanation that the norms and standards can explicitly not be abided by. This is my conclusion. But if it's politically negotiable, you can also have an additional protocol to the Weapons Convention, and you might come to the result where you don't ban any weapon, but you ban a procedure. This was my, my point I was making. Okay, so we had some comments some people wanted to have say here. Please hand the microphone over there, if it's possible. And then we're collecting questions, because otherwise we will run out of time. I'm trying to be brief. Um, what I've understood is that weapons can't be prohibited. Um, they will always exist. There will always be new weapons, and the dimensions will be extended. We'll see more and more of them. But the question is, or the result is, that I take home, is that it all depends on the procedure. Now, the way things are, at the Munich uh, Security Conference, Mr. Ischinger said that, well, how much market economy does our uh, defense system allow for? And here I'm interested in Europe. And when you ask questions about our financial and debt problems in Europe, and everything ex is extended to the private economy when it comes to carrying out these wars and waging these wars. Then my understanding of the law is that we don't stand a chance of making a difference as a normal citizen. And then our security standards, our civilian and international law standards are somewhat attacked and brittle. Thank you. We'd like to go on. And maybe on the way you can ask your question, please concerning the use of um, uh, autonomous weapons, uh, like autom uh, automatic weapons, because uh, after a few, hour few hours now a statement has been made that it could be used within international law when we make sure that, we, that it is, will be used like in a clearly evacuated uh, war zone. Now my question is, in what sense do you think that will be applicable? Because... I think the character of the contemporary uh, conflicts is that it's just really that difficult to make sure that there is a fully um, evacuated war zone and to make sure that there will be no civilians involved. Thanks. So we'd like to take your question. I'd like to be brief. I'm, an, an, I'm a historian, and I do hope 
that you will accept this as constructive criticism. I'm missing something here, which is a contextualization of this whole issue. And I believe that historically speaking, this problem um, is such that, um, well, we had the Hague Convention at the beginning of last century, and you can draw this line and achieve a contextualization of the opponents today. So on the one hand, we have the United States, a powerful country, and people who suffer from the conflicts are to be found in countries where you have malfunctioning governments. So I'm missing an outline or delimitation and a contextualization in order to understand who are the players participating in these ongoings and what could be their motivation because now the way things are is that we have this discussion and I feel a little bit powerless because I don't know where to situate this whole problem. Thank you. Thank you. My question also refers to the, as you said, unproblematic use of autonomous system in evacuated zones. And I'd be interested in scenarios in uh, which combatants would like to surrender or are wounded. And here I'm asking how, in what way a system can be able to detect and be aware of that and not open fire. Second question on political feasibility. What about likelihood? I mean, we talked about the different conventions and we said that the supreme power is often not ready to abide by these conventions and ratify them. I mean, how do you see chances of this happening in this particular area? Thank you. Two more questions. Thanks. My question has to do with signature strikes. And um, <coughs> Professor Richter, you mentioned that uh, with regard to autonomous weapons, that uh, that should clearly be banned. And I would absolutely agree that it would be hard to imagine autonomous, automatically operating weapons conducting signature strikes in any sort of a lawful way. But there is certainly some interest in the United States to ban uh, the use of signature strikes by drones. So that would be where you have a human operator in the United States operating a drone, say, in Pakistan or Yemen, where the drone operator sees a group of people doing something and strikes to kill. And in my view of international law, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking the panelists, what is your view on the international law of this? My concern is that that doesn't really address the problem because there are some signatures, for example, a group of people planting an IED, a, a bomb, that would clearly, you know, and you have um, innocent civilians or U.S. forces in the vicinity that would then be a, leg it would le be a legitimate strike under international law. But then there are other signatures where someone is simply carrying a gun or in a training camp that that would not be a legitimate strike. So um, as a human rights group, we've asked for more information from the U.S. government about what the signatures are. But there is some interest among some groups to just ban signature strikes altogether. And I wonder if you think that that um, is, would be wise under international law. Last question then here vorne. Last question in the front. Well, I feel quite the same as the two ladies, and as chance has it, I recently traveled to Yemen and Pakistan in two countries where most of the drone strikes happen. What's interesting is that the population on the ground has the impression that these drones, these drone strikes, lead to a situation where they are only victims of these strikes. Well, partly it is taken advantage of politically, and this is what they say openly. In Pakistan, they say that the drone strikes hit the right persons. This is what is being said, but still the Pakistani government uses them politically. But they have the impression that they've got nothing to do with the legitimacy of this weapon or the justification of the use of these weapons. And my impression is that the situation or the identification of combatants in these areas is not that easy. So who's going to decide, well, this particular person is a Talib or this person is a partial or part-time Talib? 
And this has got something to do with intelligence service findings. But on the ground, it's considered to be rather doubtful whether this can be done. And I'm asking whether these things don't actually stir up conflicts. Thank you. We're moving to a final round, and my two panelists here will try to answer your questions. And when anything else comes to your mind, say so, please. Would you like to start? Mr. Stroh. Yes. Um, if I forget something, please remind me. There was one question that propped up twice, the question about the evacuated zone, the fire-free zone. Oh, that might generate legal problems when we allow for the use of these systems there. But I still think it's problematic. And I'd like to second your criticism. But the field of application for autonomous systems that are reacting without human influence is something that I see problematic. And I limit this to the case described by Mr. Richter, for instance, um, marine defense, where you have ships and a metal object might come closer with a certain speed that then the system reacts automatically. I don't see any legal issues here. But referring to the other question as to what about a combat zone where, well, they're only combatants around, but for sure they would maybe want to surrender and are confronting a drone that will not just um, arrest them. And I have a problem with that as well. So I try to be a bit careful when I talked about the minimizing of alternatives um, and uh, cutting it down to either shooting or remaining inactive. And this is a problem in strike drones that arises time and again, not only in combat zones, but also in this legal gray area, something that happens in North Waziristan, for instance, that there the attempt to arrest somebody doesn't isn't even made anymore. And I think this is legally highly problematic. So I would like to subscribe to your criticism as far as the combat zone is concerned, where autonomous systems could be used in a legal way. I share that criticism when it comes to humanoids that are then acting in this conflict area, this fire-free zone, as you call it. The question regarding the historical context and uh, about the motivations, I got your question as follows. You said that well, what motivation could there be for players to restrict themselves, to limit themselves, or how could this motivation be raised? And in the United States that are often suspected of not ratifying agreements, this discussion is on the table. And I do hope and I do think that this discussion is spurred on by the prominence of combat drones that has increased over the past couple of months. And the president has addressed this himself. And he said for himself that we would have to be careful consider how to use drones in legal terms. And the discussion about drones that could be carried into the middle of society could then lead to civil society pressure, like Mr. Richter just said, for players in the East, for instance. So civil society efforts could then exert some pressure. And I believe that this can be done, but we would have to underpin this and um, follow this with a great deal of intent. And uh, so the United States might even be willing to ratify some agreements on certain methods of warfare or certain systems at the end of the day. The question about signatures and so-called signature strikes. Well, I understood it as follows. Your question was how, in terms of humanitarian international law, we might define signatures. Shouldn't we create, create criteria for signature strikes that lead to a situation where um, illegal killings are ruled out? I see this as a problematic thing because signatures, the way they're now, the way they're used now to 
attack people suspected of terrorism are not divulged to the public and pub the public doesn't have access to them and you can only suspect what the criteria are. You can only speculate. And we read some things about uh, there being only gender or sex and age that allow for a person being classified as a target. And I think it is difficult because then it all comes down to the rules of engagement of specific operations. So it would be very much upon the discretion of the state involved and not be dealt with on an international level. So I consider this to be something quite complicated. The last question referred to the status of combatant of individuals that time and again become targets of drone assaults. This is a big problem of humanitarian international law on the whole, especially in non-international armed conflicts, because there we don't have this combatant definition where for international armed conflicts uh, we have them. The definition of the combatant is way more difficult because he would not wear a uniform. And as Mr. Richter said, there are some cultural patterns of behavior that might contradict this. So some people might walk around with weapons just like this, so something which would lead to a detention right away in our country, but something which would be normal in another country. And this is a problem that's been discussed in international law for years, and the International Committee of the Red Cross has been discussing this as well, how to get more legal safety in um, non-international armed conflicts uh, when defining combatants. And I believe that For precisely this reason, and there are many other reasons that underpin this, if we want to use combat drones, then only in armed conflicts where we can clearly differentiate and distinguish so as not to enter a situation like in Yemen where there is no armed conflict. So I wouldn't even go as far as saying, well, there are combatants that could be attacked there. But these are individual attacks attacks directed against persons that are on some lists that are shortlisted and nobody knows how they ended up on these lists. And so I don't see any space for humanitarian international law because in that area we are in an armed conflict. So this was all I wanted to say on the definition of combatants in these zones. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for this wealth of qualified answers and questions. Getting back to what Mr. Stroh pointed out, autonomous weapons and evacuated combat zones. Maybe you overheard that I didn't only talk about evacuated combat zones. This was just one example coming from the operational planning of the Cold War, where this was actually done in order to um, uh, let the fire spread and harm the civilian population. And in a classic war, this was more easily possible than in a, in another war, and we in the Cold War, it was easier. But um, of course, I said that it was it would have to be military targets. But what Mr. Shaw said is right. The international law status cannot only be described in terms of the distinction between combatant and non combatant, but we would also have to consider the case where somebody wants to surrender or when somebody is wounded and can no longer fight. And to be able to distinguish and differentiate here, you have to be a human. Uh, a machine can't do this, and you can't program it like that. So I'm talking about un uh, unambiguous military targets. A tank crossing a red line wouldn't cross it in order to surrender. I'm just pinpointing things here. So here I see a larger leeway for robot robotics, but I also see the red line that is drawn and is to be respected wherever we deal with persons on the other side of the line. And this brings me to my second conclusion, second point you raised. Signature strikes, sure, we can't distinguish, not even by commanders that remotely control machines, whether what you see on the ground is a combatant and what international law status he might have. Because when somebody builds in an explosive somewhere, we do, do we know that it's the, the Afghan police doing, doing training or whether it's a Talib or a combatant? Or is somebody just planting a, a cross on the side of a street because he lost his son in a traffic accident? And of course, uh, uh, by the way, you find these crosses along all the roads in Germany. But well, but this is hard to differentiate. So I'm against signature strikes 
on principle, whether it's automatic or executed by operators, unless the operative context is unambiguous. And in classic war, it is more unambiguous than in a war where clear front lines can't be drawn, but guerrillas from civil society are operating. And then it's going to get difficult to work with these distinctions. So a signature strike is thus um, to be ruled out. And the question is, what about to do next. I mean, for all military operations, we carry out the basic standards of, hum of international law apply. And if a procedure does not abide by proportionality, and then it is banned as of now. And But when we introduce a new ban for a new uh, problem, then international law is not strengthened, but then we will have negotiations on exceptional rules that would even weaken international law. Think about it. I have no fixed opinion on it, but I have this concern. But these operations are, of course, politically counterproductive because wherever innocent people are hit, you reach the opposite of what you want to achieve. You want to eradicate terrorism, but basically you're spurring up hatred and you make sure that the terrorists can recruit new persons. And this also applies to Yemen, and it's perfectly right what Mr. Strauss said. We are not in an international armed conflict in Yemen unless the Yemenite government feels that way and declares it that way and asks the United States for help. Maybe there might be a construction that we can conceive in terms of international law. But at any rate, the distinction between combatants or fighters and everybody else that are non-fighters is very difficult to make. Um, being a member of the Taliban is no criterion. It's a political assessment. So there has to be uh, the belonging to a militarily organized and armed organization under one command, which is able to carry out coherent operations in part of a uh, state territory. This is what the definition goes. Well, not literally speaking, but this is about the definition of the additional protocol, too. If this prerequisite is not given, then in case of doubt, we have to take it that this is protected civilian population. But this fact that there are leisure partisans doesn't change anything of it, that leisure partisans that take a weapon at nighttime and play a peaceful farmer during the day. This is what you call the part-time Talib. And this special group of person is also covered by humanitarian international law. So marching towards the battlefield and marching back, they can be attacked because then they're no longer peaceful, but afterwards they can't. So when they don't act in these three areas, they are peaceful civilians. And this is what the law says, and this is a good thing. You might say this is not satisfactory from the point of view of fighting against terror, but otherwise civil society would be harmed. And in case of doubt, it prevails. It has prerogative, uh, especially in these zones. So how can you make the U.S. to comply with international law? That is a super political question, of course. Maybe we can make the U.S. comply with it by creating a parallel international law. We have that already. With the U.N. Weapons Convention, we have an anti-personnel mine convention. This convention did not go far enough for many NGOs and for many states. As a consequence, another legal path was embarked upon. The coalition of the willing, this time in a positive sense, was forged. And in Ottawa, the anti-mine convention was passed. There are, I think, about 120, 130 signatories. I don't remember the exact figure. But this over a longer period of time creates international common law. However, there is one problem with those parallel approaches, the approach outside of the UN context. As a negotiator, you always have to choose. Do you want universal, universality of the norms or do you want to set a high standards and thus lose states? This is the catch-22 that you have to cope with and you have to make a decision. And of course, there is also a political window of opportunity. I would claim that until the end of the Cold War, Germany wouldn't have passed the entire mine convention either. Afterwards, yes, this is why other states say, yeah, you are good in a good position in Europe. You still have those things behind you um, that we are still confronted with. Therefore, we cannot sign that document. There was one question that has been left unanswered, how much market economy 
is good for defense. One thing is very clear. Outsourcing war to private companies is impossible. That doesn't exist. There are special regulations for private security companies. There are even international conventions on that. But there is only the responsibility of the state for or in the area of security. Everything else would go against international law. And, of course, the industry wants to make money with weapons by selling them. Last pledge, if you want to have a technical discussion, then make sure that it is technical and not only with under the blueprint of the United States using drones. What the German government wants is not to reproduce this blueprint. On the contrary, Germany wants to take a critical different position. Yes, thank you very much. The colleagues of SWP suggested the chance that Germany does not need strike drones at the moment should be used in order to think whether you should introduce a longer ban or renunciation and then fight for respective conventions and regulations, like Mr. Richter said, or like I was not able to present as a moderator. I think there's a chance, but at a political level, we need people who push that, and we also need a vigilant international public society that exerts pressure. So having said that, thank you very much for your patient, patience. And I would like to ask you to continue vivid discussions on those topics. Thank you.